Hello, everyone, and welcome to our new show, the Paleo Post Podcast. I think we are here for episode four. And on this show, Genevieve and I will be reviewing some of the most important, new, and exciting topics relating to paleoanthropology and anthropology in general. Each week, we'll be going on air to help you help teach and educate science as it is being done. So get ready because your weekly paleo post is incoming. All right, we are here. Episode Woo-hoo! four. I know. It's so fun. It feels like we were just here. And yet there's already so much more news again. It's I I, it's fantastic. Like truly, I'm like, who knew that there's so much going on in the paleo world? And I we know. have like three continents again. Like this we, week we was yeah? I mean this week was particularly big i think in terms of the range of news i mean it was it was quite an interesting week and we had a lot of big discoveries that might impact our modern human evolutionary thinking that's awesome so which that brings us to our first story yep which we are going to be discussing this skull that was found in china that is unlike any skull that has been found before now this international team described it as a possible new lineage of somewhat near modern homo sapiens meaning it's not a neanderthal they don't know if it's a denisovan they don't think so but honestly we don't really know what a denisovan looks like so it could be until they have genetic testing True story. <laughs> it does not look like the recently dubbed Homo longi, or um, as my friend Chris Stringer would prefer to call it, Homo doliensis, um, does not look like that exactly. So what do we have here? Well, they're actually thinking that possibly this might have been a Homo erectus that made its way into China and possibly interbred with what was there at the time, either modern humans or Denisovans or whoever was there at the time, and created this actual new lineage that's extremely close morphologically to modern humans, but is not there yet. They have a distinct brow ridge. They have a low sloping forehead. Mm -hmm. Um, It it looks to me, I'm looking at it very Neanderthal-like if we're talking about it, but there are very oh, okay. differences. But the fact that here we have a new lineage, I mean, it doesn't happen often. The last time this happened was, I believe, well, it was Homo longi, I guess, but that's still way up in the air you on mean, whether oh, that was Yeah. Any. Well, okay, here's here's my thought. You you're better at like morphology of skulls and things like that. I mean, I I've certainly done that as part of Mm. my anthropological background but um i I think where my brain went with this instantly of course is um for the listeners give them a quick little backstory here so erectus of course moved out around the old world um i think the oldest they moved out was around 1.8 million am i right i feel like it was around 1.8 potentially well that's if we want to call them homo erectus correct okay so Big but big there. Yeah. And the hand axe people were a little later, if we want to call like the hand axe. Like so, but million plus ish. Right. Folks who were Homo erectus like <laughs> moved out, <laughs> moved out from Africa. Again, probably based on environmental conditions and right. just, you know, I mean, basically all of our hominid relatives, it's like if the paths are open and you know the hills look green in the distance, like I, I think they just kind of went right. So Absolutely. yeah, and I, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, was that some of that lineage wandered off into Asia, and mm-hmm. that whereas in other places Erectus seems to have been replaced or gone extinct earlier, that there's a site called Zugudian, right? Zugudian in China, which I believe right. they have Erectus at 250,000, if I'm not mistaken, which is ridiculously late. Um, right. Right. And so I've always been really fascinated by that because that would mean that there was still Homo erectus descendants. And keep in mind, listeners, that it's not like the Homo erectus would have just stayed like statically like 
they were a million plus or two million years ago, like they're also evolving, developing, changing over time, adapting to their environments, doing their things. So just like us, Neanderthals, all of our cousin species that are out there were they're, they're not like it's not like a freeze frame so they would have been doing their own thing moving in their own direction and, and so it fascinates me to wonder what would a direct homo erectus descendant look like for one thing right, right. um which you know and then also what would our ancestors who also wandered in there both denisovin and homo sapien at various points like did they interact with them did they think they were the same i'm always so fascinated by those big questions and then Maybe the other question we always like to know is, um, was there any interbreeding that took place? Right. Exactly. <laughs> right? exactly. And that's really the big question yeah. when it comes to that. Because knowing and understanding our relation to them as a species or, I mean, we could do a whole day's episode on what is oh a gosh. species, but right? we're going to get into that right now. So yeah. we're calling it a lineage. So yeah. we're not going to call it a new species because we're not sure what it is. And it no. could have been bred. It's a whole thing. But it so, could be yeah. an offshoot, basically, offshoot, is what you're saying. Exactly. It could be its own thing. could be an offshoot. Yeah, but it's probably close enough it could have interbred with other Absolutely. relative hominids. That's what they're yeah. thinking. Absolutely. But, you yeah. know, we'll try to get DNA probably or protonomics. I'm sure that's being worked on, but we'll just yeah. have to see. But now, one thing that was just super interesting. So there's this story coming out yeah. of china this week but then in france there was a story that came out this week as well from the site of grotte de ren cave yeah and they found a well it's first of all is a cave that we know neanderthals occupied for tens of thousands of years yep. we also know they occupied it at a time when homo sapiens had entered into Europe and at different times, Homo sapiens lived in the cave and Neanderthals lived into the cave, kind of like uh, Denise of a cave a little bit, but yeah. in France. And they found in a, let's see, was it actually in a. It was a Neanderthal layer. Yeah, it was in a Neanderthal yeah. layer. They found a hip bone, the ilium, the little part, the crest of the hip, the I believe. The area. Yeah. And, um, it's not Neanderthal. It, nope. morpho first of all, morphologically is what we're speaking. We don't have DNA yet. Nope. Morphologically, it's not Neanderthal. Oh, first of all, it's a neonate. So it's a very... A tiny baby. I know, which is baby. always so sad. It's yeah, a it's a baby, tiny but... baby. Yeah. So yeah. It, it does not represent any Neanderthal um, features. Not any, but it doesn't re represent most Neanderthal features we've seen. And it doesn't represent Homo sapien features that we've seen either isn't that wild so that means yeah. there's a another like, lineage yeah so it's like similar was what i got was it was just outside so morphologically so they're looking at the shape right they're looking yeah. at the shape they're looking at the curve they're yeah. looking at the ratios and measurements like that's kind of if i remember from doing it in university <laughs> where you're measuring things so exactly. we, what, what they're saying is it's outside the boundaries of what would be normal i mean right. quotes for the listener's exactly. point of view so, um for both neanderthal and for our own direct homo sapien ancestors right so there's That's a wild. standard deviation of how much something yeah. could be different from yeah. what is quote normal first of all there's no such thing as normal human yeah. variation is broad and then it's a range it's a range. Yeah. So this ilium did not fit in the range of Neanderthals or Homo sapiens. So the first thing, of course, that people are assuming is, is this a hybrid? Oh, uh, really, yeah. there isn't really much else to, in my opinion, to think about. Um, yeah. Which could also be a reason why it died in my mind. Who knows? It could have been... Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know, but it's um, always the question, right? Is how viable are hybrid babies, right? right? Like, which is right. something we don't really know. Um, kind of exactly. like what is it, lion and tigers would make their ligers? Like, there's all these yeah, ways that right. you can do it, but they're not mm -hmm. necessarily. It, it's not necessarily an easy one. Various versus right. mules. Right. Well, I've met some mules. Those guys are tough. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> like it, it just depends on which kind of hybrid it is, right? Absolutely. Um. So. The other possibility, so it could be a hybrid, the, the love child of Grotte de Rennes, um, or right. it could be another lineage you were saying. So that's another thing. I think I saw that too, where they were saying, or is it another close cousin species, um, which, I mean, 
again, we don't really, we don't know. Denise Evans, what do we have? We have finger bones. I feel like we have, we have little tiny bones. We don't have the tip of a pinky. Yep. Part of a mandible. So a jaw bone, yep. part of a jaw bone, the lower jaw um, and a uh, few teeth, few molars. Yeah. See, that's, see, we don't really know then also no. like, and I think for the listener's point of view, I mean, I know you've got an excellent skull collection, but I think it's useful to point out how few examples we have from mm-hmm. most species so exactly. that there's a lot of guesswork and a lot of, quote unquote range we may not even know about like we don't necessarily know the range of what could even so it's, it's always such a fascinating question when it comes to like what what is it that we're we're using for our baseline here um i actually um speaking of that on one of the yes. episodes actually on the episode that i'm posting today on uh the story of us i interviewed um dr ryan mccray who did his PhD on basically the fossil bias. That oh, there we go. Literally what we're talking about. Look exactly. at that. And I'm looking, also um, aligned. <laughs> I'm looking at this chart that he made and I, yeah. he only, he did Africa. So it doesn't include Neanderthals, No, but just basically looking at this, every single species that is represented, the most, um, Posited fossil is, of course, dentition, permanent dentition, so adult teeth. Yeah. So when we're talking about these individuals and everything, we mostly have teeth. We yeah, and we you can't build a body out of teeth, like yeah. you don't know, right? So it's insane. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. No, it's it's, and so I think that's one of the things that's so interesting. I mean, it's 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 like the cave art stuff I do, but even more so, right? Which I would sort of say it's like we're peeking through a keyhole of a door and trying to rebuild the room, like. Right. You know, and this is this is a really good example of that too. Or what I was wondering too when I saw that was that so one of the things that really fascinates me about our own direct Homo sapien ancestors is of course they're around for around three hundred thousand years. There's variation within those folks as well when it comes to you know skulls, hips, like all that sort of stuff. There's quite a bit of variation. Absolutely. Almost all of us alive today are descended from one group of those Mm -hmm. and there there was earlier migrations that left that went locally extinct right like i've been at school where that's one hundred twenty thousand years ago and the the people that they've got from there genetically speaking those are not our direct ancestors Mm -hmm. they're they're Mm -hmm. homo sapien but they're not they're not the ones who made it so my question i've always wondered often too is that like what if other ones did make it up into europe but they didn't survive to breed into argent you know so again could we be talking about like those very first waves of people into Europe? We don't know much about them. Absolutely. And I mean, yeah. just out of Africa and gen- I mean, we're cool. starting to go way off, but like, I mean, something that I just listened to yesterday was yeah. uh, Chris Stringer did an interview with, I don't remember who it was with. He does so many interviews. Um, yeah. He was just talking about the general overview of what we're talking about right now. And he's talking mm-hmm. about Flores and the hobbits and everything. And yeah. I had heard this before, but it hadn't really been explained in the way he explained it. So most people think that Homo forensiensis was a Homo erectus that got stranded on an island. They, you know, island isolationism caused them to shrink, et cetera. But what if there was an earlier migration of Homo habilis (gasps) that somehow made it out? Because they're much closer morphologically to Homo habilis than Homo erectus. And what if they then had their evolutionary path for, you know... A million mm-hmm. years but on flores oh dang and now that's what we have it's not as widely accepted but it's definitely that's, a possibility but i think it's just i think if nothing else so i mean it's just really interesting to entertain that as a thought experiment absolutely right especially because i was reading the other day i don't know if i'm correct or not on this but that maybe they didn't have fire yeah that's correct so right so the habilis thing is just an interesting little just I, I don't I don't this is not my area completely right <laughs> like I, I dip my toes in but but it's interesting that gosh what we don't know so mm-hmm. far outweighs what we do I think that's really the bottom line absolutely and, and you know for me that's one of the reasons why when it comes to the genetic stuff and when it comes to lineages and thinking again about who are who are our direct relatives and ancestors versus who are our you know close cousins and that kind of stuff um 
you know, that's where I've been really looking towards the Middle East right. in recent years, right? Which is that I feel like if we're going to understand where, because obviously I'm coming at this because I'm interested in symbolic behavior and the modern mind and the ability to make art and like do all these related symbolic behaviors, right? So what I feel like we're missing is that we don't, we've got kind of like start points in a few places mm -hmm. in Africa. Absolutely. Then there's this weird blank in the middle. And then we've got these end points. One of them is in Europe. We've got one in Indonesia. We've got an end point in Australia. Like we've got all these different end points, but there's huge amounts in the middle that we don't really know what was developed, where, who came up with it. When did it happen? Like there's so much not known yet. And like the genetics, I think, if we can start tracking the lineages, it'll just be really fascinating. I, I think that will help us to understand what was going on. Um, and, you know, that's where it's it's a rather fun segue to the last story we were going to talk about. <laughs> I know, isn't that fun when that happens? Um, so is is actually a story from Jordan. So the kingdom of Jordan in the Middle East. And um, I wanted to flag it. It's, it's 9,000 ish, 9,000 plus. So technically Neolithic end of the Pleistocene, beginning of the Holocene era. Um, but I just wanted to flag it. It was because it was such a neat example, again, of like what we don't know. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've mentioned before, I work in Abu Dhabi sometimes. I work in Jordan. I work in... So um, for me, this is about filling in the blank spots on the map. And part of it is seeing well, what, what are people doing where... And then how does that match with what we're seeing happen in other parts of the world? So in this case, it was it was just a particularly impressive children's burial. So that's why I wanted to flag the story, just because, again, burials with grave goods definitely is one of the checklists for symbolic behavior, for sure. And um, I was sort of thinking um, that this one reminded me of the Sungir burials up in Russia, which are around 24,000. This one is from about 9,000. Eight-year-old-ish child, beautiful, complex ritual burial in its own little tomb um, with mounds of ochre, so red iron oxide in the grave, and a necklace, what appears to be a multi-stranded necklace with over 2,500 beads on it. Oh, wow. Yes, and, and not local beads. This is from, I think it was Baja. Ba Baja, I think is how you pronounce it. Baja is in southern Jordan near Petra. So, of course, the big curved city of Indiana Jones fame. And the necklace is now on display at the Petra Museum there, which is a beautiful museum if anybody ever gets over there. Um, but the necklace was made of all sorts of different beads. Some of them, there was fossil amber beads that came from quite far away. There was pearls from the Red Sea. Like, it is a wild burial. And so it's this really beautiful, complex example of... Um, you know, people performing these funerary rites, and especially with children, I always think it's really interesting when you see that because it's like they haven't necessarily done anything yet to earn, I'm using quotes, to earn that much grave goods, but that must have been like a quite the treasure by right. the standards of that. And, and and to see all the interactions of trade that must have taken place in order to get all those materials in one place, only for them to bury it in the ground. Um you know, and that really speaks to the complex burial sort of rituals that we're, we're starting to see, you know, around. But like this area, again, they've got stuff going back 14, 15,000 years. It's just it, it's not very well known yet. This is part of the blank spot. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's been some neat um, rock art as well that's been identified in that region between nine and 14,000 recently as well. So I think that's an area I just wanted to bring that story up because I just thought it was again an example of what what we don't know right absolutely and you know I was mentioning to my mother-in-law yesterday that paleoanthropology if you don't if you're not willing to accept the new evidence and adapt with the change mm -hmm. you you shouldn't be in the science because it everything that we know literally can change with not everything, obviously, because that's a false idea that like, oh, we discovered this, everything's changed. But yeah. there are discoveries that really do shift the paradigm that we're talking about. Oh, yeah. And not shifting with that paradigm. Like when we discover, oh, this, there's rock art here. We never knew that. Or yeah. there's a whole new species in this area. I mean, if you're not willing to go, okay, yes, that's a possibility. 
yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> right? Oh my God. Well, I know. Well, that's the thing is that this, truly, I mean, this is a field where it's what makes it so fun, right? Right. But exactly. but but you, I think you also have to be quite willing to be wrong, right? Exactly. Like yeah. like I mean, I'm all, I, I always try and say that, you know, which is again like my theories. Something could happen tomorrow that would mean that my theories were literally out the window. But I mean, to me, I think that's like exactly what makes science so magnificent. Is that you know? I mean, I I just want to know. I want to follow the science. I don't really care if it changes. I just think it's super <laughs> exciting and I want to know everything. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, tell me more. Let's fill in. Like to me, that's what there, there's so many mysteries out there. Right. Just like waiting uh, to be solved. Seriously. Yeah, that's a hundred percent. Yeah. And you know what? I think that is a great place for us it to tell is. our listeners who, you know, I really hope you guys are enjoying this because we just have such a blast making it. <laughs> but it's a great time for you guys to go out there and, you know, figure out what these mysteries are and maybe find some. Yeah. And, you know, if you have some questions about rock art or something, we have that wonderful series that you can send your questions. To them. And then if you have topics you want us to discuss, you can also submit yeah. those and maybe we will. I mean, there's so much news that we really pick. I know. We really have to pick. Um but yeah, it's so much fun, and I know we have a blast making it, so we hope you guys do, too. Yeah, Enjoy. I hope, having, I hope they're having fun, Leslie. Yeah. I'm sure they are. I mean, that's what I mean. It's it's like, I was saying the other day that, like, I, I feel so privileged to have a passion I get to do as a job. Absolutely. You know, and I think that there's so many people who are like, oh, I wanted to be an archaeologist when I was a kid, but I was like, I am. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, this is where if we can, if we can share some of that joy and some of the excitement with people, I mean, to me, that's the point, right? Otherwise, right. why find it? A hundred percent. Yeah. All right, guys. So with that, we will be signing off until next Friday. <laughs> and this might be on Spotify. I'm not sure, but it's on Podbean and iTunes just in case. Nice. So you can listen there. All right, guys, we will see you next time. Bye for now. Bye.